the programmer underwent a series of tests. It was determined that the overall reliability and construction of the mechanism had successfully experienced the abort, the impact, and the accident remaining in working order except for the smashed transistors and wiring. The sustainer engine for production model 109D was installed and inspected. The engine was connected to the afterbody of the booster and upon completion of installation and preliminary checks, the launch vehicle was raised high above the production line and moved to the dock where complete system checkouts were conducted. At Wallops Island, the construction of Little Joe 7's booster was progressing. The outer shell or casing was installed around the rocket's body. This single stage solid propellant test vehicle was constructed and test flown during this report period. Two Redstone launch vehicles were delivered during April for use in the suborbital flight tests of Project Mercury. While data analysis and evaluation continue on the MA3 programmer, spacecraft and launch vehicle integration systems checks are being conducted to prevent recurrence of the malfunction in the MA4 catalyst booster. The three astronauts selected as a team for the first suborbital mission of the flight program were subjected to extensive tests during April, May, and June. Refamiliarization with the expected redstone G loads and the accumulation of biomedical baseline data was carried out at the human centrifuge trainer at Johnsville, Pennsylvania. Each of the three flew at least two mercury redstone G profiles. Special restraint and biomedical data gathering equipment from NASA's Ames Research Center was used during these training runs. In conjunction with the training factors, these tests furnish aeromedical data recorded for comparison with actual flight profiles for further evaluation. The astronauts were thoroughly checked by flight medical officers for any evidence of physical impairment that might result in their injury or disqualification in the scheduled flight tests. Other Redstone flight profiles were run and rerun using the procedures trainer at Langley Field. Simulated systems malfunctions and abort profiles were injected into the spacecraft trainer and the astronauts here again practiced switching to the various manual controls backing up all of the spacecraft automatic systems. Roll, pitch and yaw maneuvers were practiced using the manual control systems hand controller. Proficiency was gained in the use of this attitude control trainer. The three axis attitude simulations observed on this indicator familiarized the astronauts with flight roll, pitch and yaw recognition. From 55 to 60 hours per week were spent by the astronauts in the procedures trainer number two at Cape Canaveral. Practice of the suborbital flight retro firing sequence by the astronaut, the Mercury Control Center, and the Goddard Computing Facilities was conducted, although the Redstone missions will not achieve the speed for orbit where such firings will be necessary. Mercury control personnel underwent extensive training for the Redstone boosted suborbital missions. This systems test allowed the Mercury Center, using the procedures trainer to simulate actual flights for complete systems integration as well as operational training. Additional training was received by the astronauts as spacecraft communicators. Data was recorded and tapes made for use in tests of the tracking network for additional calibrations. With Project Mercury's flight program in its final qualification tests, the astronauts continue to practice in-flight coordination in high-performance aircraft and study aerial photographs and observation charts of both the Earth and the stars for visual recognition when in flight. Each Mercury flight is different, either in terms of the spacecraft, the launch vehicle, or the specific mission itself. 
And each astronaut continues to practice test runs on both static and stress devices to ensure that Project Mercury has the highest caliber test pilots with which to conduct its flight program. The ground tracking network, 18 stations in all, was completed during this quarter. Prior to the ME-3 launch, the entire network was operational. The Bermuda station continued undergoing inter-systems checkouts. This facility is a duplicate control center with command control capabilities. The station was completed and ready for operation during the month of April. The final two stations to be completed were Kano, Nigeria and Zanzibar. Simulated orbital flights using the procedures trainer at Cape Canaveral and test aircraft were plotted here at the Mercury Control Center. These tests of the entire network gave astronauts, Mercury Control Center personnel, and tracking station technicians additional training for the Mercury orbital flight program. The tests and the intra-systems checks are still being conducted to perfect familiarization with countdown procedures and handover control techniques. The delivery of production spacecraft number 14 to the Wallops Island facility initiated the flight test program for this period. During April and May, three spectacular flights were produced. The culmination of the entire Project Mercury program is dependent on the results obtained from hardware tested from both perfectly programmed and executed and unplanned malfunctioning flight tests. A maximum dynamic load test of the escape tower sequence at high altitude was planned for April 19, 1961. The modified spacecraft was mated with the Little Joe launch vehicle. During the launch, a hang fire developed in one of the caster rocket motors. The resultant down pitching of the test vehicle booster produced a much lower trajectory than was planned. The abort took place at 13,000 feet at Mach 1.47. The main parachute deployed followed and disclosed that no structural damage had been experienced either in the abort or in the landing. All test objectives are considered to have been met and exceeded. After delivery to the Cape Canaveral launch facility, spacecraft number eight was unwrapped and underwent rigid systems checks and testing in Hangar S, from which it was moved to the launch site and raised for mating with the Atlas launch vehicle. The payload, a simulated astronaut, was scheduled to pass in one orbit around the Earth and upon recovery and data evaluation to have been the forerunner to a manned orbital mission. The escape tower is attached to the spacecraft. In the blockhouse, the first half of the countdown went smoothly. Telemetry equipment was checked and readied. Data recorded here was used for further evaluation of the Atlas launch vehicle and were influential in further systems. The spacecraft was thoroughly inspected and no structural damage was incurred either from the high dynamic loads of the abort or the impact and is presently being refurbished for another flight test. In the latter part of April, spacecraft number seven was delivered to Cape Canaveral to Hangar S. After systems checks, the spacecraft with an astronaut aboard underwent pressure testing in the high altitude pressure chamber. The Redstone launch vehicle to be used in the flight test was delivered, checked and tested, and then raised on the launch pad. Two days before the flight, the Mercury recovery forces put to sea. And this test was to be the free world's first manned space flight. The command ship, the aircraft carrier Lake Champlain, was to be the first solid thing the astronaut would touch after a scheduled 16-minute flight into space. 